Good morning and welcome to Erasmus TV. Statues around the world are toppled and defaced as part of the Black Lives Matter protest. And worldwide, discussion about monuments and representation of history are being viewed. How does a historian see this phenomenon? Here with me is Maria Grever, and you are Emeritus Professor Historical Culture. Good morning, Maria. Thank you. That's so how, through the eyes of historian like you, what do you think about the destruction of the mainly colonial statues? Well, it's, it's a very important and interesting uh, development and phenomenon. Um, and my first th thought is, well, this, this is, there's nothing new in, in the world because, of course, this already happened in the 18th century and, and also before. People try to, uh, to uh, show that they are against the uh, people who are standing uh, on... Um, yeah, repressing uh, them. Yeah, and, and people are, are uh, kind of monuments and um, that uh, they want to show, well, this, this guy, or mainly men, by the way, not so much women, um, they have done cruel things in the past and uh, our voice is suppressed and this guy is again continuing uh, the, the, the suppression of a specific group of people. Yeah. So that's one side, I can understand it, but um, on the other hand, I think that you should be careful as well because not all statues are uh, very much only focused on suppression of people. Yeah. Uh, for instance, um, um, if, if you look at the monuments, the statues, uh, enrichments in the south of the United States, they were erected because they want to show the white people over there that they still are superior to black people. So their intention is to insult people, to, to say we are in power, mm -hmm. and it's quite a different thing compared to, for instance, a statue of Columbus. Mm -hmm. So. I can understand the emotions, and of, particularly also what, what happened in Bristol with Edwin Colston, that they throw away the statue, threw yeah. it in, yeah. in the water, uh, because it was going on for, for years al already. There was a culmination of, of, of yeah, you know, feelings of, of frustration yeah. and, and suppression. And so this, this wasn't, yeah. I expected it by a way, but I was surprised by the moment. But, um, but if we see um, uh, in the Netherlands, yeah. So you understand the link between the Black Lives Matters to the um, uh, how do you say it to the to the destructions of the yeah the, the, at least the, the, the protest against statues standing high uh, in the center of a city and uh, if you know that this person has uh, killed many people that's for instance the the, the notorious monument of Van Heuts mm -hmm. a general who was a very <laughs> tough guy uh, in the Aceh war in Indonesia. Um, and so he, he killed lots of people. And, and there were at the time already people when this monument was erected who protested against mm. that. In 1935, a big monument of Van Heuts was erected, unveiled by Queen Wilhelmina, by the yeah. way, who supported his actions. But at the same time, there were people who didn't who didn't like that, who want, want do not want. So, so it's not a, a new thing, no, actually. No, no. Okay. And uh, oh yeah, last week you presented your new book. And in this book, the importance of monuments and rituals are discussed. Yeah. But why is it so important to have them? If you are going to a monument, it's it's tangible. You can you can gather people around the monuments. Uh, it's a kind of also an, an, an anchor point in the minds of people. So it, it, there is a need of people with material culture, statues, monuments, etc., to, re, to remind what happened in the past. That is, that's a part also, of course, collective identity of the Dutch or the French or the American people, etc. But some statues and monuments represent dark times in human yeah. history. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we talk uh, to president of Erasmus Multicultural Student Association, Chital Nicolas, about the colonial monuments and statues in the Netherlands. I see it well so that as a standbeeld or a street name or an uh, instelling is vernoemd naar iemand, that it a blijk is van maatschappelijke waardering. Van uh, deze persoon heeft iets betekend voor dit land, dus we vernoemen iets naar deze persoon. En 
ik denk als er dan zo'n um, reed verleden is, als um, zo'n persoon zulke handelingen heeft gepleegd, is de vraag, willen wij deze persoon wel die maatschappelijke waardering geven als land? Um, en er zijn mensen die dan zeggen van ja, het is onderdeel van de geschiedenis en waarom um, zou je dat weghalen? Maar ik denk bij mezelf dat het feit dat een school of een, een instituut is vernoemd naar zo iemand of dat er een stambeeld is van zo iemand, als je dat verandert, dan verander je daarmee niet de geschiedenis, maar je verlegt het accent van de geschiedenis. We gaan nog steeds mensen onderwijzen daarover. Dat doen we door middel van um, geschiedenisboeken, musea, sp- uh, programma's op tv. Maar we gaan die persoon niet erkenning geven voor uh, zulke handelingen. Dus uh, Maria, wat do you think about Sheetal's point of view? Ja, yeah, I completely agree. I can understand what she's saying. Absolutely. Um, and it's, well, it's also depending on the kind of case. Eh? Um, I mean, van van Heuts, I I would say, um, well... Go away with it. No, well, (laughs) uh, at least, uh, like in Koevoorde, it's it's a a statue of uh, van Heuts, so you you can replace it. Or uh, at at least try to make some explanation, because when it's standing in in a square, high, somewhere in the street or in the square, then still, indeed, there's a kind of appreciation. So... I'm I'm very careful about s- destroying all these kinds of statues that, because that is not a, a, a medicine against uh, racism. Eh? But it, it's but, nec- but what do you, what do but, we have to do? Well, I th- I think that you uh, you can replace it, for instance, near a museum and and make a kind of exhibition where this statue is a part of that exhibition and and explain what the background is of that person, but also why people in the past appreciated this guy. Like Van Heuts, he had opponents and he had also supporters. Mm -hmm. And um, the opponents, they lost because there was this big monument in Amsterdam and also names of streets and other uh, statues of Van Heuts. Um, But so if you destroy all of them, them, then you, you, you cannot understand what happens. So, but you have to do something. So, uh, n- nobody in the Netherlands would like to have a statue of Hitler or Goebbels, or nobody wants to live in a street like uh, Göring Street. But so you can understand that nobody in Indonesia wants to have a statue of Peter Zon Kuhn. Kuhn? Jan Peterson Kuhn, yes, of course. But yeah. So you, you understand the emotion? Uh, uh, I, well, but for some monuments, I would say, like uh, in Richmond, uh, where there's enormous monument standing, I think, you, well, they have to re- be replaced or s- somewhere uh, placed in, yeah. in a cellar or yeah. in a museum of, yeah. or something like that. But you have to b- judge it, you have to assess it case by case. And I would say... Uh, Jan Peterson Koen um, place another statue next to him or replace him near a museum and link this to a kind of exhibition tour with an explanation. So it's like part of the educational purpose. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. That's the same with perpetrator heritage in the Netherlands. Eh? If you destroy everything, what they almost did in the Netherlands, then there is no proof, no tangible proof of what people did, in uh, the collaborators in the Netherlands with Jewish people, etc. So you suggest we have to see it case by case. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, talking about representation of history, recently the Dutch canon was updated. Yeah. So Maria, <laughs> for those who are not familiar, what is Dutch canon and what is its purpose? Yeah, it's a good question. So the first canon was uh, published in 2006. Uh, I'm not in favor of a canon, so make, I make this very clear from the start. Um, I think the purpose was from the government, from political parties as well, to try to make a fixed Dutch entity, identity, sorry, uh, and to try to uh, create social cohesion. But, you know, if you have 50 windows uh, referring to persons and events, I mean, there is much more. And then you, you r- run the risk that there is difficulty with more perspectives, And there are also, of course, marginalized voices and discourses from people who had quite other ideas about colonial yeah. exploitation, yeah. Uh, for instance. And that, that is a, a limit when you use a canon. This new canon, you can say to some extent, is an improvement. Yeah, but for instance, I'm very glad that Anton de Kom is, is one yes, of those canon true. windows. 
But still, the idea is that a government, a state committee, can say this is important. But and do, do and you that's, think a, that's a political statement. But do you think that they don't have any say in uh, deciding, like, this is important for our national identity and this not? And this we can forget? No, well, the good thing is that we all discuss uh, the, the canon. So we are discussing it and why this window uh, has a woman or not, or something, or why not more about uh, the Antilles, etc. So that's a good thing. And they are very careful right now because they say it's a kind of inspiration, it's a kind of illustration. Uh, but the most important thing for history education is that you, of course, read the stuff, but then discuss it. Then try to think about what were the intentions of those people. But what were also unintended consequences about their actions and more perspectives about what happened in the past. And who should have the say about which subjects? Well, not a central government, <laughs> I would say. Uh, in the end, uh, I think that you should organize every five year a kind of pedagogical debate mm -hmm. with uh, history educators, with uh, people who are very important in society, societal groups, um, and also with didactic exp experts and to try to, f to create some kind of common frame, but not... But not yeah. the government. No, Government, not. stay no. away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But like you, you have uh, mentioned um, uh, national identity, but also a collective uh, memory. memory. Yeah. To, uh, to which extent are Dutch people aware of the dark times of their history, you think? Well, the trouble is that uh, the 65% of young people uh, do, do not have any history education anymore. Because that's the, the, the situation in the Netherlands. It is an election. You, you can elect it or not. It depends of, of your, your package of, of subjects. And it's not uh, mandatory anymore. Since oh. 1968, that, that's my frustration. They, so they, they, uh, they published the canon, and they published also a, a package of uh, 10 areas, etc. and in the, um, in the high schools. But why not make history as a topic in all schools for all ages mandatory? Then so, you are sure that they learn about it. Yeah, so that's uh, that would be your suggestion, that make yeah, it mandatory, I, I, I'm, but... I'm writing and telling this almost 20 years or 30 years, yes. Yeah. And uh, talking about 20 years of teaching and telling people that they should learn <laughs> yeah. history. So this new book also means your retirement from the university. Well, it's a compilation uh, of uh, adjusted and uh, updated articles and chapters, uh, except for two uh, texts. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of uh, goodbye uh, volume, you could say. Oh. But I'm still committed to Erasmus University. I'm still doing some things. I have uh, five uh, PhD students who I supervise. I am also a member of some committees here. Um, so you're not really leaving the university? Well, uh, well, okay, fundamentally, so of course. I'm but not going yeah, to say no, goodbye. No, 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 I will be here sometimes. Okay. Yes, I will be, yes. And But can you name some experiences that belong to the highlights of your years at the university? Uh, well, there are many highlights. <laughs> That's a difficult question. Well, one of them is uh, uh, when Nancy Fraser, wh when she received the honorary doctorate, mm -hmm. I, we, we presented this to her together with philosophy with Jos de Mul. It was very interesting and very nice. Another highlight is uh, I've been a member of the board of the Premium Erasmianum, and I was the, 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 the woman, the person who gave the laudatio to Habermas, a, a famous philosopher. Uh, at the palace uh, at the Dam in Amsterdam. And uh, the Premium Erasmianum being a member that, of course, it's related to here being a professor. In, in the position of a professor, you can do sometimes jobs and tasks. You are asked to do that, and that, that's very nice. But what I miss most is yeah, lecturing and teaching, having contacts with students and PhD students. It's, it's really... Uh, yeah, great to see the development of particularly the PhD students when they finish their manuscript and when they defend it. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, that's great.
Oh, nice. And but you still have a lot of plans of coming. Oh years. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Maria, for coming and enjoy your retirement. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Don't forget to visit our website at erasmusmagazine.nl. I'll see you on Thursday.